to the cloud. All right, welcome everyone to the webinar. I'm here with Paige Pen Penzarello. How are you? I'm well, thanks for here. Um, great to be here. Thank you for asking me to, to join you on the show. So we, we met up a few months ago. That's kind of where I was following you before that because you were doing some really good stuff uh, social, me social media wise and posting a lot of blogs and things like that. So for the people who don't know you, why don't you introduce yourself, your company, what you do, what you specialize in? Yeah, absolutely. I'm known as the Cashflow Chick. Um, again, my name is Paige Panzarello, the Cashflow Chick. <laughs> and um, my company is actually Trichoma Trust. We uh, specialize in buying first position non-performing notes. Um, and our goal, is, our main goal is to get, is to help families um, stay in the home, avoid foreclosure, and uh, make a nice profit while doing it. So it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a little bit, in, I'll tell you a little bit more about me in, in just a moment. Um, okay, so why don't you start the presentation? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't want to give everything away in the intro. That's right, that's right. So, so you could begin and, and I'm just gonna turn my screen off for now. Perfect, perfect. So today, um, as you know, everybody, we're talking about the sexy in double Ds. Um, you know, of course, I, you have to know that I get some, some feedback from that. And of course, my, my thing clicker is not working. Uh-oh, there we go. Um, what were you thinking? Of course, I'm talking about due diligence, not double Ds. <laughs> Um, so a little bit about me. I just told you a little bit. Um, I'm Paige Panzarello, the cash flow chick. My company is Trichoma Trust. Uh, we buy in non or, excuse me, first position, non-performing notes, mostly secured by residential real estate. Um, I am a, an investor that has been an investor almost 25 years now. I, I've said for a long time over 20, and I just did the calculations. It's actually uh, almost 25 years. Uh, and a little bit about me. I've done just about everything there is to do in real estate investing. Um, I started my investing career by being thrown into the deep end of the pool, knowing absolutely nothing about real estate investing. Um, my family, I had a family member that passed away and she had some buy and hold property, 38 townhome units in Arizona. Um, we owned a sewer treatment plant and we also had some land and um, knowing nothing about real estate investing i went to arizona to figure it out uh, and to handle my grandmother's estate and i i found uh, that you know we were in a position in a boutique market uh, and we weren't able to command the rents that we needed to command in order to be able to turn a profit so we sold the sewer treatment plant uh, we sold the 38 townhome units and I decided that I wanted to build on the land, um, knowing about this much about construction. Uh, so I, you know, was young and aggressive and bold and I decided, okay, I'm going to build this land. And I started, um, I hired some contractors and I very quickly realized that they were taking advantage of me um, and they were overbilling me. So being the young, bold entrepreneur, real estate investor that I was, I said, I'm gonna start my own construction company. And I did. Uh, I found a gentleman that came in and, and I made him a partner in the business. Uh, he was our qualifying party. We held all of our licenses. Um, uh, everything residential, some commercial. Um, we built big buildings, we built commercial um, buildings, we built projects, um, real estate projects, you know, residential projects, homes, et cetera. And this was in the early 2000s. So um, I, was, I was really very, very aggressive and fortunate. We grew to about 36 employees. And um, in, and, you know, we were building, building, building in 2005, 2006, everything. And then 2007 happened. And Hey Paige. Yeah. Sorry, uh, your 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 uh, your audio is good, and then it goes and fades a little bit. I don't know yeah. if if you're notice if anyone else is noticing that real quick. Just comment in the chat. Just a few people. I don't need like everybody. Also, okay. We're doing a Facebook live. <laughs> okay. I just I just turned it on, so hopefully it's working. 
Okay. All right, let's see what everyone's feedback is. Say, yes, it's fading in and out. Yeah, it's fading oh, in. Oh, it's so strange because I've got my microphone right here. Is that, let me move So, it like, you're closer. clear right now. How and about then, here? Is that better? Let's just keep going through, and if, if I notice it again, maybe we can make an adjustment. Okay. But and go right and, ahead. And Mahir, so you know when you muted yourself, um, that air, it sounded like um, an air conditioner or a fan hmm. went away. There's feedback coming from your computer. Okay, I'll check that. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so, oh, I see more hands. Is that better, everybody? Everyone's saying it's okay now. Okay, good. All right, I moved it a little closer, so maybe that, that was it. Um, okay, so uh, 36 employees rocking and rolling in 2005 and six. Uh, we were just building everything in sight, and then 2007 came. And, you know, the interesting thing is that I saw it coming. Uh, I knew it was going to happen. Uh, and I thought, well, it's not going to happen to me because I was only leveraged about 10%, meaning all of my, I, I had a lot of liquidity, I had a lot of cash, I had a lot of buy and hold properties, I had equipment, um, you know, a booming business, and I was only encumbered with debt about 10%. And so silly me, being the young person that I was, I thought, this is not going to happen to me. And I was wrong. It happened right on my head. Because what I realized is that even though I was liquid and even though I had these great relationships and I wasn't over encumbered, everyone else around me that owed me money was encumbered and they, their funding dried up. And so when you're in construction, um, typically what happens is, is you're 90 to 120 days before you, uh, you receive your payment. So you pay for your supplies and the construction, um, your crew, and then 90 to 120 days later, the person that you've done their, their project, they pay you. So that carrying cost was excruciating. Um, and I realized that I was going to have to uh, do something about it so I could pay, you know, the, my investors, I could pay my vendors. So I started fire sailing everything and cash was king in those days. You know, if you had cash, then you could get rock bottom prices for everything. And I had, I literally was forced to sell everything um, at rock bottom prices. And at the end of the day, um, I did end up, I didn't file for bankruptcy but I did end up uh, having to, you know, liquidate literally everything I owned, including uh, my cash. And I walked out of Arizona uh, in 2010, three years later, having paid everybody, but I lost, uh, and I, but I had nothing left and I lost $20 million. And I tell that story for two reasons. Um, 20 million? Yes, $20 million. I lost $20 million in, 20, in between 2007 and 2010. Wow. It is, it's a massive number, but understand, it's a number. And that's part of why I tell that story, because I'm sure that some of you out there have had some traumatic things happen to you in your real estate investing career. Um, and when you lose, it's a matter of mindset to get back in the game, okay? But it also shapes you. It shapes you as an investor and it shapes you are and who you are as a person. Um, so there is hope if you have had some loss. Um, it's just a matter of tuning your mindset to another channel and getting back up and doing it again. But this time, learn from that lesson and have it shape and mold you. And we're going to talk about a little bit about what's your what. Okay, there's plenty of real estate investors that are out there that talk about your why. And that's great. Um, you know, it's great to have a why, what gets you out of bed in the morning and why you're doing what you're doing. Um, but it doesn't dictate the road that you're going to take. Um, so what I mean by that is for me, when I came back into real estate investing, of course, I went away for a couple of years, understandably. Um, but when I came back into real estate investing, I wanted to make sure that I was putting my money and my time, which is our most valuable asset, um, to use in, a, in the right direction, in the right place. So I had to determine what do I need? What do I need? Do I need streams of income? Do I need chunks of cash? Do I need both? Do I need short-term play? Do I need long-term play? Um, so all of those things played into my decisions in the roads that I took. Um, and I really was guided in my uh, uh, real estate investing career from that point forward about my what as opposed to just my why, okay? So, um, oh shoot, 
my clicker's not working for some reason. All right. All right, so we're talking about due diligence. And like I said, the key really is what is your what? Okay, it's knowing what your what is. And the secret um, that I'm gonna share, the first one, is that due diligence gives you a, a huge amount of control, okay? Um, due diligence is your, uh, your process that you go through. And everybody knows when you're investing in real estate, you're gonna make your money on the buy, okay? You're going to collect your money when you sell or when you exit. And if you do your due diligence well, and knowing what your what is, then you're going to be able to almost mitigate almost all of that risk, okay? And for me, that was hugely important for obvious reasons, all right? Um, when you do your due diligence well, it's going to allow you to have control over your purchase and sale price, over your exit price. It's going to give you control over the length of time of your investment, okay? Um, Non-performing notes for me does this. It gives me control over the length of time. It gives me control over, um, you know, the exit prices. It gives me control over creating chunks of cash and streams of cash. I can do both in this vehicle. If you're in a fix and flip scenario, you're generating a chunk of cash. So if your what is that you need monthly cash flow, fix and flip is not the vehicle that you should be using for your investment, your investments, because it's generating a chunk of cash. If you need monthly cash flow, buy and hold, or perhaps non-performing notes, uh, or even performing notes, that might be a better avenue for you to go down. Um, and the reverse is true. If you need chunks of cash, don't go into rentals because it's, that's a long-term play and it's going to um, generate monthly cash flow for you. So if you need to generate chunks of cash, that might not be the vehicle for you. Okay. So really, I challenge everybody that I speak with, know what your what is, know what your risk tolerances are. Okay. Um, when you're in a fix and flip situation, you're speculating that you're going to be able to um, fix that property well in a certain period of time and sell it for a certain price. That's speculating. When we do our due diligence well in the non-performing note space, we can remove almost all of those question marks. We don't have to speculate, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, okay, so in non-performing notes, again, you have the control. You can go into chunks of cash or streams of cash or both, short-term or long-term. And then exit strategies. Here's another thing about control. When you're in an investment, you want to make sure that you have as many possible exits as, as you can have, right? Um, in fixing and flipping, there's really only a couple. Same thing with buy and hold. But if you're in the non-performing note space, we literally have 23 different exit strategies at our avail. Now, that doesn't mean we use all 23. It just means that they're available to us. So if you, you know, and we generally use maybe four or five different exit strategies when we're, when we're planning to dispose of um, and, and exit a note. Uh, depending upon what the borrower wants to do. But again, when you know, if you do your due diligence well, you're going to know those answers ahead of time. And when you know those answers ahead of time, you, you have control and you can mitigate your risk. Okay. Um, the, one of the things I love about this particular form of investing is that it's not location specific. I literally can do this business anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world as long as I have a phone and a computer. So I don't have to be stuck in one specific place. If my business, if I choose my, to move my business to a different country, I can do that in this space and not miss a beat. Um, so for me, you know, again, that's exercising a lot of control. Um, knowing your what is very, very important. We're gonna talk about that throughout the webinar this evening. Um, you set your guidelines, you set your guidelines to you and what is important to you, and then you stick to them. Don't ever make the deal, uh, conform to the deal. Don't you change your criteria so you're conforming to the deal. Make the deal conform to you. And if you do that, now you've mitigated most, of, most all of your risk and you're gonna exercise a tremendous amount of control and be successful, okay? 
Um, so just, you know, that, that's a habit of, of some people. They're so, they want to, to do a deal so badly that they're willing to just take anything. Please don't do that, especially in this space. And if you don't, um, you'll do very, very well, okay? Okay, so virtually risk-free um, real estate investing uh, through due diligence. Here's how you do it, okay? There is no such thing, in my opinion, as a bad note, but there is such a thing as buying notes badly. Again, we just talked about one of the things buying notes badly. If you conform to the deal just because you want to do a deal, that's buying a note badly. But if you make that deal conform to your guidelines and your sets of standards, now you're buying notes well. Okay, so make sure that you set your guidelines and that you stick to them. Knowing your what is key. Okay, so here's how you start to develop your what. Develop your criteria. Know what you want to go into in terms of your real estate investing or your note investing. Here's some things that, that we talk about. Um, we do three sets, by the way, of due diligence in our business. Uh, we do two free sets of due diligence, and then the third set is a, is a paid due diligence where we actually start to pay for things um, to make sure that all of our numbers that we've already checked is, is appropriate, okay? Um, one of the things is property valuation. Of course, we use online, and anybody who has been in real estate and real estate investing for any length of time, they know that Zillow and Realtor and, and Trulia are all tools that are at your avail. Um, again, you know, yes, use that as a starting point to determine your valuation, but move on quickly from there, okay? Um, because oftentimes that, that's just a computer putting together information from the MLS and their algorithms aren't necessarily accurate. So use it as a starting point, but go on from there. Um, when you know the property valuations of your target assets, you're also going to be able to determine, to determine your price, okay? When we're dealing in non-performing notes, cash is king. I mean, there is not really any financing unless you use private, um, private funding partners or private money lenders. You have to buy these things for cash, as everybody knows. Um, so if you know that the valuation of if you know you have a certain amount of cash, as long as you know the valuation of the property, you're gonna be able to determine kind of what your purchase price is gonna be. If you have $50,000 to spend and you're looking at a $300,000 property um, that's collateralizing these notes, uh, that's not something that you're gonna to wanna to go into because the purchase price is gonna be very likely higher than the 50,000 that you have. So know the valuations of the properties that you're, um, that you're investigating. Now, in first position, typically we evaluate the property that's collateralizing our investment, okay? That's collateralizing that note, the borrower's promise to pay. Um, in second position, typically you will um, evaluate more of the borrower and the borrower's ability to pay, okay? So what we're talking about in this due diligence that we're talking about today is going to be specifically geared toward first position, uh, just so everybody knows. Okay. You want to verify um, that a structure is present on the lot. That is very important. Uh, if you don't, you know, if you just strictly rely on Google Earth, uh, you, you need to pay attention to the imagery date, okay? Uh, you need to know when Google Earth passed, you know, either on the road or up above, and uh, you need to know what you're looking at. So for us, we always make sure that we have, we, we look at Google Earth, but when we get to a place where we're now starting to do some of the second and third stages of our due diligence, um, we're actually going to have people go buy that house, make sure they take pictures, uh, and make sure that, that there is a structure that's present. I can't tell you how many times I've, I've had, I've heard a couple stories, you know, from, from newer note investors uh, where they just relied on Google Earth, didn't have somebody go by the property, didn't have boots on the ground, and sure enough, you know, the, the house had burned down to the ground. Well, that's just as much as your investment is now burned down to the ground with it, you know, so make sure the onus is on you to do good due diligence, all right? always, always, always have somebody drive by and verify that the house is actually there. Uh, really super important. Um, here's an example, okay? Now, I have to tell you these are not the same house, but you get the idea. So 
Google Earth showed this house May of 2017. And then in August, look at what happened. That has actually happened to several different investors um, that I know uh, because they relied on Google Earth. And there's not, I mean, there's a three month period of time that's a gap here. So just make sure that, that you lay eyes on the property that's collateralizing your investment. Uh, that's just good due diligence. All right. Um, again, knowing what is key. Excuse me, one moment. Okay, so delinquent taxes. You want to make sure that you call the county and verify what delinquent taxes, um, if, if, in any, if there are any. Okay, now sometimes you will get an answer that there is, are zero taxes owe, due and owing, you know, that are owed or due. Um, so what happens, what question do you ask if the county is showing a zero balance in the taxes that are due? You ask them if there has been a tax lien or a tax deed sale. And the reason, if, if there's been a tax deed sale and it's in limbo, there's no longer a note, you've been wiped out. Um, municipal li liens like taxes, um, code enforcement, uh, any of those are going to survive any kind of foreclosure or sale. Um, and they can wipe you out. They do come before your first position, okay? So that's really important to know. So if there are zero taxes showing, and don't rely online. Go online, trust but verify. Go online, take a look, see if, if they have the legitimate uh, taxes online, but call always, always call the county and make sure that you're verifying what taxes are due, if there's a tax lien or tax deed sale that's pending, um, or if there has already been a tax lien or a tax deed sale um, that has paid those taxes off, because that will show online a zero balance due. And if that's the case and you buy the note and you didn't ask the question and somebody forecloses on that tax lien, now your investment is gone. Your investment dollars are gone. So again, trust but verify. Always make sure that you call the county and find out about delinquent taxes. You wanna verify if there's any junior liens, um, any second mortgages, third mortgages, fifth mortgages, if there's any judgments against the borrower that have attached to the property. And that becomes important because when you're talking about um, being able to, to exercise one of the exit strategies, which is a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which means the borrower is going to sign over their interest and their title to that property to you as the bank as payment in full. So they're giving you the deed in lieu of you foreclosing on them as payment in full. Now your loan goes, if you accept that deed and you haven't checked to see if there's second or third mortgages, if there's liens or judgments that are attached to the property um, against that property, your loan now goes away when you've accepted that deed in lieu of foreclosure. Your loan is now gone and everybody moves up a step. And now as the homeowner, you now uh, have, have that obligation to those liens or judgments that were behind you now those are your responsibility. So if you don't verify um, you know, what, those, what those liens or judgments are, uh, then you're gonna be in trouble if you take a deed in lieu of foreclosure. Um, some liens, again, will be wiped out if you do do a foreclosure um, and others will not. So always, always, always uh, trust or verify what liens and judgments are there. Now we typically will order, um, we used to just order just an O&E report, which stands for ownership and encumbrance. Um, now we actually do a full title search because we wanna make sure that there's not any unreleased uh, first position liens that, that might be appearing that are not necessarily going to attach to the O&E report. Um, so we have been very fortunate that we're pulling full, uh, full title with abstracts um, through the, through. Pro, we use Pro Title USA. Um, we love them, uh, and and we've found that that's better for us. Um, it gives us a broader scale um, a, against that property and against that that borrower. So now we have a bigger picture. Okay, but always make sure that you're verifying your lien holders, any junior lien holders or any judgments that are due and owing. Okay, you want to verify the type of asset. Um, for me, there are plenty of of people that are, are note investors that really like to invest in condos. Um, they like to invest in mobile homes. 
they like to in, in manufactured homes. And that for me doesn't work. Um, so know what kind of assets you like to invest in. Do they, are they single family one to four? Are they commercial buildings? Are they, um, do you love condos? I, I mean, whatever is good for you, that's fine. Just stick with it. Um, so make sure that you know what asset is, you know, that, that note is, is collateralized by, okay? And, and just, it, you're going to waste your time if you start evaluating all of these different things um, and you know that you don't like mobile homes. And here's why I don't invest in mobile homes, by the way, because I don't want to rehab and it's very difficult to find funding for a new borrower on a mobile home. So that doesn't work for me. I want to be able to enter in and exit out um, of, of an investment uh, quickly. And so that might not be a mobile home for me. Um, same thing with condos. I'm not a fan of HOAs. Uh, sometimes they can be very tricky. Um, whenever a recession hits and you know that, I mean, everybody knows that we're kind of at a crest right now uh, and that we're gonna be maybe seeing a little bit of a downturn here fairly soon. Um, if there's a recession that hits, condos are the hardest hit. Again, I want to be able to sell our, that asset if we have to take that as, a, in a, as an REO, uh, real estate owned either through foreclosure or deed in lieu. I want to be able to sell that asset pretty quickly. So I have a tendency to stay away from condos and mobile homes um, and land, you know, but that might be a niche for you. So know what your what is, all right? Um, we also want to verify occupancy, and that's important because we need to know whether or not our borrower is actually living in the property. We have a certain obligation to protect their information as well, so we need to make sure that, um, that if, we, if the property is occupied, we need to know who is occupying it. Um, so generally, we will have property preservation do a door knock um, to verify if, we, you know, if it's occupied, and if it isn't occupied, then we make sure that we have property preservation go in, um, change the locks and hang a lock box. We have a legal right to protect the, the collateral that is securing our investment. Um, so that's one of the first things that we do. Uh, so make sure that you verify the occupancy status and the asset type. Um, again, do banks get it wrong? All the time. I can't tell you how many times a bank has said to me, uh, you know, yes, the, the property is owner occupied and it turns out that the property is vacant, or even better, watch this. Okay, so this is an actual case study um, of, a, of an asset I was looking at. Uh, the bank told me that this was an owner-occupied duplex. This actually was in Ohio. And so I said, okay, great. And, and I went on Google Earth and I did Google Earth and I looked and uh, went to this, you know, immediately went to the street level and, and took a look and okay, great. This is a cute little duplex. And then I noticed that the imagery date was really old. So I zoomed out and look what I found. There was no duplex. And I know that because do you see the walkway here? I mean, the walkway's there. Um, so trust but verify. Always, always trust but verify and always have boots on the ground. Um, if you do see a structure, especially if you have an old imagery date, make sure that you go buy the property. Um, because the banks do get it wrong. They have thousands of assets oftentimes uh, that they're dealing with. So trust but verify. Little cute, cute little slide there. Uh, something's not right here. <laughs> okay, so again, knowing your what is really, really key. It is absolutely key. Um, you want to know the number of bedrooms and bathrooms uh, that uh, in the house that's collateralizing your loan. Uh, for me, I typically don't do anything that's less than, than two bedrooms and one bathroom because one bedroom, one bathroom or studios are, are very difficult to sell. Again, I want to be able to come in and out of, of our investment um, rather quickly and because stagnant money is not, in my opinion, a good thing. I like to have my money in motion and making friends. Um, so I choose the path of least resistance. I typically only invest in two ones. Um, or more, okay? Square footage, that's another one. You wanna verify the square footage of the house. I typically don't go into any investment in a house that's less than 900 square feet. 
Um, there's plenty of little cottages that are out there that many people do very well with, but again, I'm not willing to sit and, and try and sell that property um, for 120 or 150 days. That's not, doesn't fit my model as an investor. I know my what, okay? Um, verify the year built. Why is that important? Uh, very, very interesting story. Uh, you know, one of my earlier notes that I invested in, it took me a really long time to sell it. We took it in foreclosure auction. So now it was an REO, nobody bid on it. Um, and I hadn't realized that it was a much older home and there was knob and tube wiring. Um, FHA will not lend to anybody if there's knob and tube, and that's a very, very costly repair if you're going to rewire an entire house. Um, you also may run into galvanized pipe. Um, that's also a bit of a no-no. Lead paint, asbestos siding, um, all those different things play a factor in, in the year that it was built. So pay attention to those things because again, that's going to affect your bottom line. Um, and if you know it ahead of time, you can make adjustments uh, to, to the numbers in your purchase price to accommodate if you think that you're going to have extra dollars that you need to spend in order to be able to sell that house. Um, I hope that makes sense. Of course, you want to verify the lot size. Um, you know, now if you're dealing with a row house in, in Pennsylvania or Maryland or whatever, uh, you know, the lot sizes are, are significantly less. Um, but if you're dealing with a single family residence, you want to make sure that, that you're going to be able to, to uh, know, you know, what your lot lines are, what your lot size is, and if that's common for the area. Um, it also allows you to check uh, with the county assessor and make sure that there's no adjustments that have been made um, or any easements that may be on your property, okay? Or the property that is securing, that's collateralizing uh, your invested dollars. County name and population. This is a big one for me as well. Um, typically, my team and myself, we don't invest in rural areas. Uh, we know, when we know the county name, we can go to a website called bestplaces.net and we are able to figure out a variety of different things, not the least of which is uh, the population. Uh, marriage statistics, that's another one. Um, there's generally less crime in areas that have marriages, the, the population, if the married population is over 55%, generally that area is gonna have a lot less crime. It's really funny and fascinating if you start paying attention to the due diligence that you're doing and you start to realize that the higher crime rates are in areas where there's the population has a lesser amount of married, married couples, okay? Um, so knowing the population is important also because your pool of buyers is going to be bigger or smaller. So for us, we generally don't buy in populations that are less than 50,000 people in the county. Um, now, there is an exception to that rule if it, if it borders on a county that has a good number of jobs or is growing, that might be something that we're looking at. But again, this is a data point that, that I don't waste my most valuable asset, which is my time, on, on places that don't meet my criteria. I'm able to scratch them off the list right away, okay? So knowing your county name and population will give you some keys uh, to be able to make that determine that determination. Again, um, bestplaces.net is gonna be able to tell you also in the county of violent crime and property crime. Uh, you wanna make sure that you know, you're not in a war zone. You don't want to own a, a note against a property uh, that is in a war zone because it's gonna be harder for you uh, to, to sell it. So make sure that you're aware of all of these statistics. And don't be scared off too um, by certain, you know, some, some places like Memphis, Tennessee, for example. Memphis, Tennessee in some zip codes have very high crime ratings. And if anybody who's invested in Memphis knows, uh, you know, it varies kind of street to street and a couple blocks, you know, right or, you know, to the east or to the west is going to give you a completely different picture. So talk to your local realtors, you know, make sure that you talk with your local realtors and ask them to help you 
uh, if you don't know an area well, get their take on it because believe me, they will give you a ton of information um, that's always good for you to have in your, in your pocket, in your portfolio, because you can make educated decisions and mitigate your risk, okay? So um, this is an actual house that I saw. Uh, I actually was in Texas. I, this is when I was doing some tax deed sales. Um, this was in Harris County and sure enough, uh, the, the crime rating, there was not a copper pipe left in this house. Uh, so, you know, know, know your, your populations, know your crime rate, your crime statistics, and then trust but verify. Uh, so talk to local realtors and, and boots on the ground or other investors that you may know. Um, Bigger Pockets is a great way to, to do that as well. Okay, so again, knowing your what. Very, very important. Um, rents in the area, it's very, it's important to know the rents in the area. Why is that? Uh, because if the rents in the area where you are buying your note are less than your mortgage payment, your borrower's not necessarily going to be incentivized to stay in their home and work with you. Now for me, um, I would much prefer to work with our borrower and keep them in their home. There are other investors that will invest in notes with the sole purpose of foreclosing on the property and taking the property back and rehabbing it. I've been there and done that. I don't want to do that anymore. That's not my what. Uh, that's not, that doesn't fit me as an investor. Um, so for me, you know, I would much prefer to keep our borrower in the home and work out some sort of trial payment plan that converts into a, a permanent modification. If I know the rents in the area are higher than the mortgage payment, then I'm going to think that our borrower is more incentivized, will be more incentivized to stay in their home and work with us because it's going to be cheaper for them to do so in the long run. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Um, of course, we want comparable recent sales. Um, we need to determine value because value is, is where I base my pricing. I don't ever base my pricing on um, unpaid principal balance, though I know there are pl plenty of investors that are out there that do. I do not. I base it on the value of the home um, and then at a significant discount. That gives me a lot of control. I also will reduce, I generally, it's called net taxes. So I will generally reduce my bid um, or my offer price if there are delinquent taxes um, on that property as well. So knowing those delinquent tax dollars, you know, what's owed will help you to negotiate a better price with the bank and create larger um, margins uh, of, of equity in that property that's collateralizing your loan, okay? Um, so know your comparable values. And, and know the data. I mean, be specific when you're talking to realtors. We use realtors all the time and we don't ever lie to them. We explain what we're doing. We explain we're note investors. We, we ask them for a few minutes of their precious time. Um, we have to let them know that we do value them because we do. Uh, and don't ever lie to them. Please don't ever lie to realtors because they can be a very big asset in your toolbox um, if you just treat them fairly. Um, so our realtors, we tell them, please don't look up, don't just look up distressed properties. Don't necessarily look up just REOs. Look at the house as it is. Um, and I know sometimes we can't get into the properties inside. Uh, sometimes we're able to if we get a really creative realtor. But, you know, if we, if we can't, then take the determination by what the outside looks like. Are the shutters falling off? Is the roof have a blue tarp on it? I mean, you can make the determination if the outside looks terrible, it's very likely that the inside is going to look the same. If it just looks like there's the house was maintained, but maybe the weeds are too tall, you know, same thing. You can probably determine that the inside is at least decent, you know, or medium, you know, it doesn't, maybe it just needs some cosmetic versus a full gut rehab. Um, so determine that and tell your realtors, you know, please don't just give me REOs because REOs typically are valued through the MLS as much less and that's going to bring your values down and you might miss out on some great opportunities because the values don't hold. Okay, so know the area and get really specific in what you're looking for with the realtors and also make sure that they take pictures uh, for you. Okay. Um, don't mix after repair value, ARV, with as is. 
totally different scenario. ARV is what you do when you fix and flip a property. Um, so make sure you can know what the ARV is. If you think you want to take a property, if you know that the, that the property is vacant and you think you want to take that property and, and rehab it, sure, know what your ARV is. But don't base your purchase price from the note seller on ARV. Base it on the as-is value. As it stands right now, if you had to sell it within 30 days, what is that price? Um, so know that value really well. And again, the deal has to conform to you, not the other way around, okay? Um, you wanna make sure that the data inputs are as close as possible. You don't want a property that is two miles away. You want a property preferably within a quarter mile. You don't want to compare, you don't want a comp. Um, if yours is a three bedroom, one bath, you don't, and it's 1100 square feet, you don't want a comp that's five bedrooms, three and a half bath, um, and 2,500 square feet. You don't want something that's got a lot size, you know, that's 10,000 square feet versus 5,000 square feet. Know your data points and get your comps as close as possible to those data points. Um, and if the realtor goes out beyond a mile uh, to get you those comps, ask why. Um, because there are some areas of the country that, that there are certain pockets that things don't sell as quickly, don't necessarily go up for sale as quickly, and they might have to go out a mile. Um, but so, you know, again, trust but verify and know your markets and know what you're looking for. Um, it's not going to do you any good to comp this home, as you can see, which is tiny, with this home, right? Or these homes, okay? You want to comp like for like, and it is an art, um, and I would practice. And the more you do it, the better you're gonna get. Again, it's all about control, okay? Due diligence, and I mean this, due diligence gives you knowledge. Uh, note investing, a lot of people try and fit note investing into a box, and it doesn't fit in a box. You need to have a baseline, and it gives you data points up and down um, that you can adjust and make sure that you've got all that knowledge. When you have all that knowledge, knowledge is power, okay? And when you have power, you have control. And when you have control, you can mitigate your risk. And to me, that's the sexy way um, of, of investing and, and mitigating your risk is sexy because it really takes the guesswork out of it. So I hope that you can feel that and you follow it along with it. So be sexy, right? But be smart sexy. And the only way to do that is with great due diligence. Bring the sexy in the double D's. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great name. Thank you. Thank you. Due diligence, uh, from my side, my specialty was always uh, the non-performing seconds. And people would always think that we're crazy for investing in it. But like you said, <laughs> When you do the due diligence, it's, you take all the guesswork out. You know what the result is going to be. And yes. a lot of people try to shortcut this part, no. um, you know, but that's where the money is like truly made. If you, you know, you could waste a lot of money on bad bids um, and, and without following up information, it could be properties with the tax sale. It could be uh, you missed, you missed on the home value. It's so important to look into this stuff. It's, it's huge, and, and Mahir, you hit on it. I mean, this is where you make your money. Due diligence, if you're willing to skimp and, and cut corners on due diligence, that just means you're willing to take your money and throw it in the toilet, because this is where you make your money, is your due diligence. And if you do it well, you will make money, and you will mitigate it. For me, as an investor, that's a huge thing. Mm -hmm. Especially when you grow and you start using other people's money. Because when you use other people's money, you've got now a huge responsibility to protect that money. Mm -hmm. Treat that money better than you treat your own money. And mm -hmm. if you don't do your due diligence well, you're not doing that investor any favors. But you're actually doing them I take this, my team takes this very seriously. We have a whole checklist that we do. Mm -hmm. um, don't ever skip a step ever especially when you work with other people's money you try to explain to someone yeah. you try to explain to someone uh, why you lost their money and when you go to your due diligence and you go to your tape and it's incomplete 
it's just a bad look and it's going to set you back going forward. If you're ever trying to raise more capital going down the line or open up a fund, Absolutely. you got to have, you got to have that bulletproof where, look, I did everything I possibly could and we still lost money. Well, at least you, at least you say you did everything you possibly could. You know, and it's interesting too, Mahir, because, because, you know, you may take a little bit of loss, but if you've done your due diligence well, it's very likely not going to be a big one. Um, if you have a little oops, okay, no big deal. Uh, but if, if you haven't done your due diligence well, then yes, absolutely, you can lose a lot of money and that's never a good thing. Uh, you know, and, and we place immediately, the minute we wire funds, I force place the insurance immediately uh, because that's just another protection. I would rather pay an extra, you know, 30 or 40 or $50 um, for a month or two, uh, you know, to make sure that there's insurance that, that is covering that property that's securing my invested dollars and my, and my funding partners invested dollars. You know, that's important too. Uh, so that's something that we do as well. That's an important cost that you brought up at the force place insurance. So as note people, we're generally pretty cheap, but that's not one that you want to skimp on. So you have to know which costs are, are important to get resolved. Like, you know, uh, finding the right attorney, just making sure that yep. that attorney's working and doing what he can for you uh, for, for the right amount of money. Cause there's a lot of attorneys that'll charge you an arm and a leg and aren't doing anything. Absolutely. It's, it's important to know where you're spending that money. And that's like comes with experience and building out your team. Absolutely. I totally agree. I totally agree. And educating yourself too. You know, that's a really important thing here is, is your education in this space. Don't go into, um, you know, in, any kind of investing without some semblance of education. But you really need to have some education before you start putting your money and uh, other people's money, especially into it. So um, educate yourself. And there's a variety of ways you can do that. I definitely agree. We have any questions from the group besides the, the audio? <laughs> <laughs> so any questions? We'd love to hear from the, some feedback uh, in the chat or in the, um, the Q&A section. I think there's a Q&A section somewhere. Um, anyway, while we wait for that, what else are you working on? What's coming up? In pages we actually do um, a little bit to the education uh, we myself and my my partner and my team have often been asked we want to learn to do what you do um, and so as such we have we do workshops uh, there's only three per year and it's called uh, the building wealth with notes workshop we've got one coming up in Orange County in July so July 20th through the 22nd it's three days and on um, we will teach you all the due diligence steps. We give you access to our teams. We actually um, do practice due diligence. Um, it is hands-on and we feed you lunch. Uh, so if that's something that you're interested in, go and go to buildingwealthwithnotes.com um, and check that out. And uh, if you want to, if you have a partner, um, you know, of course, Mahir, for any of your, your people, I'm more than happy to either have them bring a partner for free um, or we can give them a, a, a $97 discount on the, on the admission. Um, again, three solid full days. You will learn everything you need to know to protect yourself. And uh, we feed you lunch and network. You know, we, we keep it small. Um, we don't have two or 300 people there. We only allow 50 seats. And once they're gone, that's it. Uh, so if that's something that's of interest to you, please reach out to me. You can always contact me as well. Uh, info at cashflowchick.com. Uh, or page at cashflowchick.com. That works too. Uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs> oh, you're muted, Mahir. There you go. All right, I'm back. <laughs> we got a couple of comments here in the chat. Yeah. All right, so Sue Ellen, I got a few comments. I also look at schools and how many rentals are in the area of the subject property. That was her comment. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. That's important as well. And also job growth. Um, you know, you need to know that there's jobs in the area because real estate really is based around jobs. Uh, so if you see that there's a decline in the market, you know, and that there, the, the, there's a huge amount of unemployment in that area, then that might not be an area you want to invest in a note. Absolutely. Thanks to Ellen. All right. And then we got a comment from Brandon. Good evening. What are some suggestions you'd give to a newbie would be investors who are still trying to assimilate all of these moving parts into a cohesive 
<laughs> well synchronized and well oiled note investing machine. Absolutely. Okay, so if you're new, again, education is key. Um, if you've already gone down the education road, I always suggest um, to anybody that attends our workshops um, that they partner with somebody at least their first two notes. So that way they can have a, a sounding board and a safety net. Two heads sometimes are better than one. Um, so that is an option of trying to get it well oiled. And also don't bite off more than you can chew. If you know what your what is, if you know that, that you, know, you only have a certain amount of money, um, don't try and put it into a ton of notes that you have to handle all at the same time. Maybe start out slow, you know, one or two, work through the process and then start growing bigger and bigger um, from there. But there are oftentimes, you know, people will just say, oh, I've got a ton of money and I'm just gonna lump it all in and I'm, I'm gonna hope for the best. And uh, I would suggest not doing that. Um, especially in this space, because there are things that you can miss. You might not want to, and you might not have the intention of missing it. You might go down your checklist, and you still might miss it. So don't bite off more than you can shoot until you start to feel really comfortable with what you're doing and who you are as an investor. Right. So, what does Gary Vaynerchuk say, right? Your patience is killing you. It's, <laughs> yes. it's, so, it's so true, though, because Everyone gets so excited. I'm going to bring on a hundred thousand, you know, five hundred thousand, a million dollars, and they're not ready for it. And then they get swallowed up by it, and then all of a sudden they're not in business anymore, and they're in some trouble. So it's it's okay to be a little patient. Build it up, build the framework out, build the systems out, and then graduate up. And then you might even find it that hey, look, I like managing my own portfolio. I don't like dealing with everybody else, and that's that's fine. You don't have to be. Uh, a fund, you know, you don't have to be a fund manager to do really well in this business. You can Absolutely. invest your own capital and do that. Absolutely. And you know, there's, there's a lot of panic out there, Mahir, that you hear right now. Oh, the note market is drying up and that there's not enough product. Baloney. Um, if you do your research, uh, you know, we already are sitting on inventory that's current with Fannie and Freddie right now. Now, granted, they're only dripping it out a little bit. Um, but they, they, there's so much, we calculated there's about 30 years in the current inventory at the drip rate that they're, that they're letting go and releasing the inventory. Fannie is releasing anywhere between six and eight billion dollars four times a year. Six to eight billion dollars four times a year. The last study that, that we looked at, there's almost a trillion dollars right now in bad debt. Right now. So there's inventory. They just got, it's just a matter of getting connected with the right people. Exactly. And so sometimes <laughs> that's just, yeah. Sometimes just partnering up with the right person exactly. to make exactly. that, make that whole go through. Yep. All right. So Sue Ellen also added onto her comment from earlier. Uh, she also looks at commercial development, the community, like Publix, Kroger, that kind of stuff going on in the area. Absolutely. All good data points. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. All good data points. The more information you have, that's more knowledge, that's more power and more control. So absolutely. All right. Let's go to the Q and a real quick. Mark Kapsky. Mark, how you doing? Long time. <laughs> uh, when you receive a large tape, how do you efficiently do the proper due diligence quickly? So you get a tape, you're on a strict guideline deadline. What do you do to, to buzz through it? Absolutely. Okay. So I'm in a very unique position. Um, and, and I will, I will say that at, at the Building Wealth with Notes workshop, we actually give you um, a single analysis of our, uh, uh, it's called the single note analysis tool. My business partner, um, who originally started out as my mentor, uh, he created a software program where we can take a tape uh, up to about a thousand assets, input it into this, into his software that he created. And within, you know, based on our preset criteria, uh, we're able to determine within, you know, about 15 minutes, uh, the assets that we want to dig further into that actually meet our initial sweep of criteria. That's only available through us, that nobody else has that. Um, we give you the single note analysis version of that. But to answer your question, if you know your what, so in other words, if you only want to invest in non-judicial foreclosure states, know what your non-judicial foreclosure states are, and then don't look at anything else beyond that. Um, if you can, you know, so that'll oftentimes eliminate half of the, half of the tape uh, because that doesn't meet your initial criteria. If you look at um, uh, 
you can go down from there. You know, I only want to focus on these two or three states. When you're first starting out, pick two or three states, start there. And that will eliminate a lot of the tape and now you focus down. And if you don't find something by eliminating like that, then maybe broaden your, your reach a little bit. Say, you know, add one more state and just kind of go from there. You'll get the hang of it, but that's, I think, you know, if you know what your what is um, and you know what criteria is good for you, that's the way to minimize the tape and get through it quickly. Right, so like in the seconds world, right? When we were, when we were allowed to, um, we're looking at a large tape and we were allowed to pick the loans that we wanted our criteria right off the bat is, is the senior lane current? If it's not, all right, then stop looking at it. If it exactly. is, all right, then let's go to the next step. What's going on with bankruptcy? Right. Okay, bankruptcy is good. Then let's go to the next one. If it's not, okay, stop looking at it. So yeah. you have to know and like uh, have a laser focus. Sometimes Absolutely. you get curious and you're like, oh, well, this person, they had a quick claim deed and then they uh, had a foreclosure and they came out of it. It's not important. If it's not a loan you're going to buy, just stop looking at it. That's how you'll save a bunch of time. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, and again, trust but verify. If you only want vacant properties because you want to fix and flip them, then don't look at owner-occupied. Look at the vacant properties. I mean, there's all kinds of data points that you can use to minimize that tape um, and reduce your time frame um, so you're not wasting your time trying to figure out every asset. Uh, know your criteria and stick to it. Right. And we got another question here from Scott. If you take a, if you hi, <laughs> if you take a loss on a foreclosure action, do you instruct the attorney to preserve the rights to a deficiency by not bidding uh, total debt? Of course, we need to know where the borrower are and if they have income or assets, that kind of stuff. Okay, so for me, um, and again, there's kind of a broad answer to this question because there are some note investors that absolutely never ever waive deficiency. 99.9% um, .9 of the time, I do waive deficiency. Um, understand, you know, for me, a lot of these borrowers have been beat up by the banks. Um, some life has happened to them. I know firsthand how life happens. Believe me when I tell you, I know firsthand. So these aren't necessarily bad people. Um, there are people that are out there that will milk the system and take advantage. But if you do your due diligence properly and you read those, the collateral files, I read every page in a collateral file, me or my team. We do, we read every page, we read the servicing notes, we read the collection notes, um, the, the borrower outreach and previous you know, uh, um, um, conversations or, or attempts. So we have a really good handle on what our borrower is about, okay? Um, generally speaking, we, we will waive deficiency, although that is um, a persuasion that your loss mitigation team can use. Um, if you've got a borrower that's kind of really milking the system and taking advantage and create and putting up stumbling blocks for you, um, you can always have your loss mitigation say, listen, we have the right to, to go after any deficiency even in a foreclosure action. Um, and, and that might motivate them to stop playing games or give you the deed in lieu or, or proceed in a different direction uh, because you are entitled to it. But for me, for the most part, I waive deficiency. Uh, I don't, it's gravy, to be honest. Um, if I can make money, you know, at, at a lesser amount and faster, that's fine by me. But that's knowing me and who I am as an investor. Mm -hmm. That's important, uh, like that you kept saying to you. Uh, yes. Everybody is different. Yes. Um, and sometimes they're more aggressive, so they're more you know, going after the real estate and trying to take advantage of the equity or that location or whatever that might be. And other people are going to sit are, are in a different boat where they're looking more cash flow and they're going to really be creative and trying and benefit the borrower as much as possible so yeah. they can get that cash flow coming in. So depending sure. on you, and it doesn't mean that one way is the right way and one way is the wrong way. Exactly. It's just, it's just up to you. And I, me personally, I take a deal by deal and that'll tell me if I should do something or not do something. Absolutely. And how much time and money are you willing to spend pursuing deficiency and also to pay your attorney to pursue deficiency? Mm -hmm. That's not worth it. Mm -hmm. I would rather use, like I said, if we've got a difficult borrower and sometimes we do, um, you know, I would much prefer to use that as a little bit of leverage um, to say, listen, you know, we have a legal right to go after this and we will if you continue to play these games. Let's work together. We want to work with you. 
Um, and oftentimes that will happen, that will work, you know, and we don't have to go down that path. But yeah, for me, it's not worth my time or money to pay the attorney. Um, and I already go into, in, into my note investing, um, knowing that these borrowers are way underwater. Uh, and, and, you know, we try and figure out, we, we do our due diligence well, we buy them well, and uh, usually we, we can exit them very well, and it's a win for everybody. All right. I'm just going to take this last question sure. from Brandon, and then we'll wrap it up. Sure. So Brandon's question is, how, do, how does a partnership look? One party handles the funding, the other provides the experience necessary to work the note. Do you have a checklist that you work with to cover the most important due diligence steps? So I think you hit on a couple of those. Okay, so for us, yes, that, that, that's like three questions in one. Awesome, Brandon, thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of, of joint venture partnerships, we do do them. Um, I generally don't talk, I, it is on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't work with everybody that wants to work with us um, because when you talk about partnerships and you're talking about people who have emotions and money, it's very much like a marriage. Okay, and people will often jump into that marriage and not date. We date our investors. So our funding partners um, and our JV partners, we date. Um, so if that's something that's of interest to you, please reach out to me. You can book directly onto my calendar, a 30 minute session. We'll get on a phone call. We'll start talking about that and we start dating. Um, there are other, uh, in, in terms of other people and, and what it looks like, number one, we don't ever pool money. Okay, um, because that is against the SEC. We also, our, our JV partners do participate to some degree, okay, because if you just gave me your money, out, and now this is outside of controlling a hedge fund or being having a PPM, okay? This is just one-on-one -on -one JV partnerships. Um, if you gave me your money and I said, and you didn't participate at all, and it wasn't a loan, so there's equity participation there, that's selling a security, okay? That is against the SEC. You can go to jail for many years. You can be fined $250,000. It's not something I suggest you do. So if you go into a JV partnership, there is some sort of um, activity that has to be done on both sides with both people uh, creating the partnership. Uh, so I hope that that answers the question, Brandon. I think you hit it. Uh, and you do have a checklist that you give out to people who attend your course, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, you get a full workbook, you get access to our teams, you get everything that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. We Perfect. Okay. So why don't you wrap it up? Give them a little, you know, recap the info, your, your yeah. number, your email, everything like that, where they can find you. Absolutely. Um, again, it's on the screen, but you can either in info at cashflowchick.com, page at cashflowchick.com, and pages with an I uh, at cashflowchick.com. Uh, if you're interested in the workshop, again, we're coming up July 20th through the 22nd. It's going to be in Orange County, uh, California. Uh, I will give you either a person, you know, just, just reach out to me and I'll give you a code um, either for the discount, the 97 off, or if you wanna bring a partner for free, I'm more than happy to do that. Uh, you can also just check it out at buildingwealthwithnotes.com. Uh, and then, you know, just reach out and let's talk. I, I would love to answer any questions you have and I'd love to see you at the workshop. That's in person, right? Anyone can attend virtually or no? Um, no, we do not attend virtually. We do have guest speakers that come in as well. Um, but part of, part of the thing, and, and I do offer an online um, presence so if, if you can't attend the workshop, um, there is the Cashflow Chick community where you go, you pay a flat fee and any video, any workshop I do, that's yours for free for the rest of your life after you pay that flat fee. But I'm gonna tell you, Emma here, you know this, there's nothing like being in the room. I mean, we put people in the room that, that might be new to note investing, um, but they are investors and the mindset is there, okay? These are not tire kickers. So you're literally networking and rubbing shoulders, not only with us and my team, but um, you're rubbing shoulders with other investors that might help you in your investment career later on down the line. Um, there's something about being in the room. Now, if you like the online version, you can do the online version and we give you a 50% discount to one free, you know, one live and in-person workshop. Um, if that's the route you want to go, but 
I'm a note investor. I don't profess to be a guru. I'm not going to tell you to run to the back of the room and bring your credit card because you have to sign up for some other program. That's not me. That's not my program. Part of my give back is to educate people so that they can have a very full, financially free life and that they can design their life because I've been kicked in life. I've seen what happens. So that's part of my give back. But, you know, as far as I'm concerned, is the best place. Awesome, awesome stuff. Um, Paige is actually going to be reaching out to you guys. So I'm going to uh, speak with her a little bit after this. Yeah. Catch her up on a couple of things. Paige, I appreciate you jumping on. Awesome stuff that you covered tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it here. And thanks for the great questions, everybody. All right. We'll talk. Have okay. a good night. Thanks. Bye.